Well, thanks, Ian, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, it was really fascinating to listen to Sarah speak with Stephanie Land. You know, Sarah said, if adult learners don't fit the image of the traditional college student, that's not the case for the next group we're talking about, which is men. Um, you know, after all, for many years in this country and many institutions, women weren't even admitted into college. Um, in 1982, the U.S. government passed Title IX to try to rectify the gender inequality on college campuses. And at that time, men outnumbered women in college and among those who were in bachelor's degrees. Fifty years later, that's been flipped on its head. Um, as my guest today notes, the gender gap disadvantaging men is in fact now larger than the one women faced back then. Today, for every 100 bachelor's degrees awarded to female graduates, men are just 74, and they're missing from our college classrooms. That disparity, as Ian notes, has consequences. Of course, the wage premium associated with a college degree is significant, but those consequences aren't merely economic. Researchers, for example, have linked education and health on virtually every metric uh, college graduates live healthier lives than their college educated classmates, and they live longer ones too. So on that sobering note, let me introduce my guest. Richard Reeves is the author of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. He's also the founding president of the American Institute for Boys and Men. Richard, thanks for joining me in conversation. Let me begin to, by defining the problem. Um, you know, the, our session calls this a crisis. And um, let me ask you, frankly, is it and, and why, if it is? I think we might not be able to hear you. Does that work now? Yes, I'm terrific. So sorry about. I'm sorry. So sorry I'm sure about. we missed great insight, but it's nice no, to hear you. No, you didn't. You, you missed me cursing my other pair of headphones. <laughs> That's one of the worst audio glitches I've had since the beginning uh, of the pandemic. Typical, uh, though. So, but I could hear you well. Thank you. Well, oh, thank good. you very much for the invitation, and thank you for that framing. I think you've uh, framed framed the the conversation in in exactly the right way. So, I'm looking forward to digging in. So let me just ask you that, pose that first question about defining the problem. You know, that the fact that we know that men are underrepresented in our college and universities, I think our session calls it a crisis. Do you think it is? I'm reluctant to use the word crisis. I know why people who are writing the uh, titles for sessions or newspaper articles or sometimes even books are drawn to that word. Um, but I, I think it's incorrect to describe what's really been a slow developing issue here around male college enrollment, male educational engagement generally as, as a crisis. I think by definition, a crisis is something that happens pretty fast. And this has been unfolding pretty slowly over the last few decades, although it is getting more attention now. And there are some reasons why that's, I think, the case. I think it's partly because we just have reached various points of inequality, as you said in your introduction, where you just, it's getting harder and harder to ignore. Right. These gaps are pretty big. They're growing. Many higher education administrators, if not publicly, privately, are really worried about this. We're seeing college admissions being discussed a bit more, etc. So I think there is something close to a crisis around the roles for men, the tracks for men, the paths that men are supposed to take. And I think that's creating all kinds of downstream cultural effects. So I see higher education as one element in what's genuinely a series of questions and challenges that, that men are facing, which ranges from everything from deaths of despair, from suicide, overdoses, et cetera, down to what's happening in high schools and middle schools. And of course, in mental health as well, where we see a rising and very high rate of suicide, particularly among young men. It's four times higher among young men in that college age group than it is among young women. And so there are a number of reasons why we should worry about this question more broadly and then think about the role of higher education uh, in the challenges facing uh, boys and men and, and the opportunities that they might have going going forward. I want to zoom out in a minute about and talk about that broader context, but let me just ask you to, you know, I, I laid out the timeline, you know, 50 mm -hmm. years ago to today where things have, have totally and, and completely flipped. 
And I wonder when we look at what's happened, particularly in higher education, where where do you lay the cause? What do you think, um, not just pushed women ahead, but but what has perhaps been holding boys and men back? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's really important to make the distinction you just made uh, and to make a related distinction between what's happening in relative terms and what's happening in absolute terms. So in relative terms, you do see these wide and widening gender gaps now in favor of women throughout education and perhaps most obviously uh, in higher education. So as you said, that the women are further ahead of men today than men were ahead of women when Title IX was passed. But, but of course, that's a relative gap, right? That's against a long run trend of, of rising enrollment for both men and women, just much faster for women. And the way I think about that is that women were just artificially held back in all kinds of ways in the education system. I mean, it was it was a real thing to go to college for women, as you have alluded to in the 60s and 70s, they weren't allowed to. And even when they were allowed to, they weren't encouraged to. And so I see this as really just like taking the lid off, the ceiling off women's educational opportunities. And what you saw was women seizing those educational opportunities with extraordinary aplomb and just keeping going, right? So this sort of extraordinary rise of, of women could be driving a relative gap. In some ways, I think the absolute gap is more worrying where you see a drop in enrollment in more recent years and that that drop in enrollment uh, has been bigger for men than for women. And then just to put one more data point on it, I'm really worried about the gap in aspirations and expectations for college among, even among high schoolers. So a recent very good survey from Youth Trust found a 20 percentage point gap between girls and boys in their senior year of high school in whether they expected to go to a four-year college, a 20-point gap. We see a 15 percentage point gap in enrollment straight from high school into college, 70% female, 55% male, and that's risen quite significantly. And so I, I, I think in some ways what's happening is that the idea of college, the attraction of college, the sense of college being someone something that's for me, and it's weird to say this, as you said, for kind of men now, but I do think we're at a point now where for a lot of young men, especially if they struggle, you know, in high school, they're like, eh, I'm not sure college is for me. Whereas young women have had quite rightly the message passed on to them that they should get educated. They should, you know, there's the, the message of education as a route to empowerment and independence has re is continually and correctly drummed into young women. <laughs> um, it's in some ways, we've just assumed that young men will go to college right um mm. we've never had to think about it before but now they're not in anything like the same numbers and so now i'm thinking oh wait hold on i think a lot of our assumptions are being challenged by these data points let me let me pull a little bit on that i mean how much of it is do you think um the messaging and if if it's the messaging why 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 are we i mean is it just because we didn't feel like we had we we felt as you say that we had to deliver that message to women and we didn't have to deliver it to men or is there something also going on here that that's causing sort of that expectations gap as you say coming out of high school well i, I it would be probably a bit of a stretch to connect it to this broader question about the male role but i do think there's something about that i think that to some extent Men who were able to go to college maybe did go to college so that they could earn more and have a better career so that they could be a better breadwinner, right? That's a very simplistic, cartoonishly simplistic way of describing the old gender order, but there was something to it. And that's just much less obviously true now uh, about the kind of the role for men and why they should just take this linear path. And so I think that's, that's one link that you can make. But I, I think there's something else going on, which is simply that, uh, you know, K-12 education has been because become significantly more female dominated just in terms of teachers. So the share of K-12 teachers who are male has dropped from 33 percent to 23 percent uh, since 1980. So in a shorter time frame. So just few, there are fewer and fewer male teachers, even in K-12 education. Very, vast majority of school counselors and college counselors are, are women. Uh, and so there's just this the sense, perhaps, that it's somewhat of a female identity and that's probably always been true to some extent but I think that's becoming more true now and that's the the concern going forward is that just in terms of identity we should think about it but the other thing I'll say is this has happened incredibly fast now when I talk to younger people about this 
they don't think that a few decades is a short period of time, right? When, <laughs> like when, when you hit your 50s, you start to measure in decades. But, but the truth is that against any reasonable metric, this is an astonishingly rapid change for a sector like higher education or any other kind of sector, just incredibly rapid. And I just think it's very hard to update our priors for this new world. It's like the needles on a compass swinging around. Suddenly north is south, south is north. Wait, wait, we're talking about men? Wait, what? When did that happen? And you don't have to, you, you, it's very hard to persuade people that something can have changed that fast. And so the only other thing I'll say on this, and we may get into this, but it's important just from an empirical point of view to note that about half of the gender gap in college, in, in the, the awarding of college degrees is from enrollment, but about half of it is from completion. You know, significant completion gaps, especially you know, in terms of four-year completion. That four-year colleges, it's a ten percentage point gap. It's a six percentage point gap in six-year completion rates. And so, it's not just that men are less likely to enroll, but they're much less likely to complete. Uh, they have a much tougher time completing once they get on campuses. And yet, there are almost no four-year colleges with a men's resource center but almost every four-year college has something equivalent for women. And I don't want to be misunderstood here, Karen. I'm not suggesting for a moment we shouldn't have them for women. But right now, the very idea of a men's resource center on a college campus is seen as a controversial one. But should it be now? I'm not sure. I mean, that suggests, as you note, that there's there's multiple sort of points in this pipeline where where, the, where something's getting blocked, whether it's messaging right. or, or, or or other other sorts of, of interventions or supports, perhaps that that might help, um, you know, spur the the success of boys and men. Let me pick those apart mm. a little bit. Let's talk first about what's happening in high schools. You know, the the, the issue of role modeling, um, but but also we know that that simply put. Um, girls tend now, I mean, I can remember when we had special, because gray hair, I can remember a time <laughs> where we had special algebra classes for, for girls, for example. And wow. now, you know, would that be something to have for, for men? I mean, you, you just mm -hmm. see on, on, you know, across the board quite often, uh, girl, female students outperforming their male peers. And so I'm wondering what are the things mm -hmm. that you think are happening at that point, at the high school point in the pipeline, um, both in, rea in, in perceptions and the messages we send, but also in the kinds of, of broader um, challenges facing, um, facing boys and hindering their success. Yeah, so as as in most of the areas of, of of higher education, you can you can plausibly say, well, most of these gaps uh, can be explained at least statistically by what happens before higher education, right? Uh, so it's in high school or even earlier. Um, and I'll make a general point, and then I'll like make a sp and then specifically answer your question. The general point is that what I find in these discussions of education is that there's a tendency for each sector to blame the age group before them. Or, or rather to use it as a way to say, well, honestly, by the time they get to us, you can predict it by what happens at high school. So I'll be really unfair to everybody and say what happens is that colleges blame high schools, high schools blame middle schools, middle schools blame elementary schools, elementary schools blame kindergarten and kindergarten blames parents. Um, and so everybody gets off the hook in the end, except parents. And so the, the truth, I think, is that it's it's sort of no one's one's problem. It's not a problem of one sector of the education system. And this applies even more so to issues like race and class and so on than the one we're talking about. Yeah. But it is everyone's responsibility to make sure that they're creating a learning environment and a culture that is inclusive. And obviously, we've just heard from Stephanie a moment ago about you know, certain groups who don't feel that way. Um, so I think that's a kind of a general point, but you're right to point to high school. So um, my work uh, that I've done with Ember Smith, a former colleague at Brookings, shows that if you rank uh, high school GPAs from low to high and then break by gender, two thirds of those in the top 10 percent of high school GPAs are girls. And two thirds of those at the bottom are boys. Now, the ones at the bottom are much less relevant, perhaps, to this immediate conversation about higher education. But the ones at the top certainly are, right? So, if you, if you're if you're taking students from the top ten percent of the high school GPA distribution, then you've got a two thirds uh, majority of girls anyway. Um, uh, so, and I think that's the big driver is what's happening in high schools, college preparation, et cetera. There isn't a gender gap really in standardized tests anymore. 
One consequence of that, by the way, is that the main effect of a college going test optional is to significantly increase the female share by about four percentage points. It doesn't change very much else as far as the research I've looked at suggests. But, but if you think about it for a moment, that's obvious, right? If the only place in which boys at the high school age are holding their own educationally is in standardized tests, which does appear to be the case, then if you take standardized tests away and you look and you select on other measures, then you're bound to become more female oriented. So that, that's just a good way. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that's a good example of the tensions and dilemmas and trade-offs that colleges are facing as they try and grapple with this issue. Uh, and I think it's important that we have it out in the open rather than sometimes that there are private conversations about this issue, which are very different to the public ones. I mean, as you know, there are trade-offs. Uh, are there things that are I don't know, unambiguously seem like they, they are invention, interventions that could um, could be promising that would, would address either that that gap, that bottleneck at the beginning or, or the completion um, gap between men and women? I would say not unambiguously, for sure. Um, and uh, the trouble is that in order for us, in order for anybody to answer that question honestly, we'd have to have had some pretty sustained programs uh, to try and address this issue of relative male underperformance, and in some cases, absolute male underperformance, which had been uh, thoroughly evaluated um, and evaluated you know, specifically by gender. I don't think we're at that point yet. Uh, there, are, there aren't that many programs or initiatives that are specifically aimed at this issue. I'll mention one or two in a moment, but I think that's a broader problem actually, because what can happen is that people can say, okay, even if you agree that this is a problem, let's say you can get people to agree that this looks like a problem or it's certainly something we should be trying to get ahead of, right? We certainly shouldn't just let these lines keep going the way they're going. Let's, let's try and get ahead of it. What should I do? Show me a well-evaluated intervention that seems to work. Look, it's literally my job to be able to point policymakers to, to that. <laughs> and I wish I could. Um, I can point to interventions which seem to work for boys and for, for young men in this case, and young women like ASAP at community colleges, uh, good quality mentoring programs. And there are a few things like the North Carolina community college system um, seems to have had some success with a, a mentoring program aimed at, at uh, men of color, uh, primarily using mentors of color. Uh, by contrast, a mentoring scheme in Texas, again in community colleges, is evaluated by Melissa Carney and her colleagues, found strongly positive results for women, but not for men. But then they did point out that all of the men, all of the mentors were women. And so it may well be there's something about a fit there as well uh, in terms of the intervention. So uh, and as high, and in terms of like K-12 education, more male teachers, um, somewhat more training on the different learning styles on average between um, girls and boys would be helpful. And maybe just a bit more better messaging around college being for boys as well as for girls. And again, this is almost like those words sound weird coming out of my mouth. But but if you look at the survey evidence, it's pretty clear that like there's just a massive difference in the, the chances of a high school girl thinking college is for her and a high school boy thinking college is for him. And uh, I think that's as much of a problem this way around as it was the other way around 40, 50 years ago. Let's zoom out in the, the few remaining minutes we have to talk about that broader context. Um, you know, I mean, I think there, there, there are certainly people, perhaps not in this audience, but who would say, well, you know, this is, you know, I mean, to your point about everybody saying something else is everyone else's problem. Well, this is a problem of college. And, you know, there, there, there are so many other issues that we have to, um, to deal with in this country. How, why should we care? about the fact that there is this this disparity in in both you know in in college attainment um for for boys and men what what are the implications broader implications for society well as i think ian ian alluded to in his introduction to you um and i think it's a point you amplified as well just if we think that college is important for all kinds of good life outcomes then we should be very sensitive to gaps by group between what appear to be uh, the, the successes and failures at college, right? If there's group A that just seems to be doing better, getting better opportunities through college than group B, we should just worry about that for the long run. And, and 
I don't think yet we've really seen the economic and cultural consequences of this gap really playing out. I think I think it's going to take a couple more decades before we see that playing out. There's a lot of people, for example, panicking about marriage markets going forward and so on. Like, will will college educated women have anyone to marry because they'll only marry college educated men? I'm not panicking about that. Uh, I don't think the evidence suggests that there's any need for panic about that. But I do think like if college is good, and it's doing a good job, then it should be doing as good a job for, uh, for men as it is for for women. And as I say, I, I, I just worry about a tipping point where if we're not careful with our messaging and to some extent, even some of our programs, we end up sending a message to boys and men that college is really a more hospitable and welcoming and more appropriate environment for women. And that, again, sounds odd to say, given how quickly this has changed, but that is something that I worry about, um, that we're just not doing a good job, job uh, messaging. You know, you go to high schools and you'll very often see lots of very, very positive programs to encourage girls to apply to college. There are obviously thousands of scholarships for women to go to college, et cetera. And there's just messaging around that. It's just a very, uh, really I find it quite moving how positive the messaging is around that. But there's, there's very rarely anything like that for boys, perhaps for boys of color, but there really isn't anything more generally for boys. And again, because we haven't thought that it's needed, but given the extraordinary progress we've made, I wonder now whether we just don't want to, we need to be careful not to inadvertently send the message that college is for girls and women. Do we need then to be specifically tailoring messaging um, to men and boys? I mean, I do think that there's sometimes discomfort with that notion as, as I think you've been alluding yes. to, or or can it be, can we have these sort of lift all boat sorts of messaging that um, that can can also resonate with men? Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the right question. Um, and the the argument for gendered interventions that sort of either target a specific gender or which attempt to recognize there might be some differences in motivations or even in learning styles by gender is only justified if there's you know, strong enough evidence, there's a big enough gap, and that the and that the gap is being driven by certain factors that are amenable to, to policy intervention. So for example, like women into STEM, right? There's still quite a long way to go for that. And there was very good evidence that like there were huge kinds of barriers to for women to enter STEM courses and STEM professions. And so we had big out, we continue to have big outreach programs women leading it you know you can't be it if you can't see it lots of scholarships lots of pro lots of mentoring programs just specifically around that but we need the equivalent now to get men into teaching or indeed men into psychology and social work where we've just created the the share of men and maybe just into education generally so no let, let me be bold enough to say this given the current trends if you want to send someone from a college into a high school to talk about the college experience to try and encourage the students there to go to college Right now, I think the evidence would suggest that it would be better if that was a man than a woman. But it usually isn't. Um, well, I'm afraid we're out of time, Richard. Thank you so much for sure. the illuminating discussion. Um, I, I think uh, also a sobering one, frankly, because you know, it, I think as you suggested, there's not going to be a simple sort of intervention or a simple sort of solution that we can have. And the colleges are gonna have to, and higher education is probably gonna have to play a bigger part in these broader societal questions about the, the role of gender and, and how we see um, men and boys in this country. Um, so Ian, let me now turn this all back to you. Thank you.